What's up guys, my name is Lex Veldhuis and welcome to another episode of Lex Reflects. Again, we're diving into the big game, $100,000 buy-in, 2010, Las Vegas. And I know you've seen me play some pretty crazy hands in previous episodes of Lex Reflects, but I also felt like I ran into the deck a little bit during the big game and I think it's important to show those hands. And they're also pretty fun, especially the last one is pretty crazy. So let's just dive straight into it. Negrano opening with Kings. Obviously really good hand, uh, there's a straddle here, that's why the opening size is a little bit bigger, so we're playing 200, 400, 800, still 100k buy-in. We see William Reynolds here, was a very frequent player of these kind of games back then, played a lot of reasonably high stakes online, grinded the tournament circuit, Tony G needs no introduction of course. Calls with 10-6 off. Now the straddler, Lex already has money in and he's getting decent odds. No idea. Yeah. I close the action, call with 9-7, that's actually fine. 8-jack-10, Lex flops a straight. And we flop middle the schnizzles. Um, I really don't like my leading out here, uh, especially looking back on it. You see this is a recurring thing on the big game where I was just playing so aggressive um, that I also decided to lead out a lot. I do think that this is a board perfectly suited for like a massive check raise. Um, or at least let people do the betting. It's all still relatively dynamic as well. And that means that turn can significantly change what's the nuts on this board. Uh, if the turn is a nine, queen, king, or ace, then all of a sudden we're looking at very much different uh, hands. Um, also, I already have the second nuts. We have the preflop raiser and the caller in position left to act. They have really uh, good spread on this board in terms of hands. So I think that uh, checking and then check raising or checking around and then overbetting the turn or something would have been a lot better. Um, but that's also looking back on it, of course. I was just leading a lot. I don't know where this leading came from. I see it episode after episode now. Uh, maybe it's something that I worked in into my betting scheme. I know that I had some lead lead over bets when I played from the blinds. Obviously, a few episodes ago, we saw the hand versus Vanessa. Um, here I do it again. Also, the pocket fives versus loose cannon a few episodes ago. Anyway, I led a lot. So I lead again. Don't like it. Um... But it's fine, I lead close to pot, at least I like that, but I just narrow my range from the big blind down, right? Like, I just take a hand away from like, jack seven suited, I'm never gonna lead here. You know, I had like eight nine suited, never gonna lead here. So, it's really hard to come up with like, very uh, chill bluffs uh, on this board, because I just don't have that much full equity, and I go way much toward my strong hands. Um, so, that's definitely a disadvantage. A life-changing crash, someone saw. <laughs> oh, you love it! I it. can see it. Look at you. Oh, you can. You just love that. <laughs> Give someone a, a horrific bad beat. Wipe them out. Send them to the cleaners. You've done that before, haven't you? That smirk. Tony G has lost it. All right, so we go uh, three-way to the turn. Pots now all of a sudden 37,000. Brutal card for Lex. Nine of space, probably the worst card in the deck. Obviously, a seven would have made my straight a one card, but it's the worst card in the deck. Um, but but even a uh, jack or 10 or an 8 wouldn't have been great versus very strong ranges. My bet there is absolutely awful. Um, I, I really think that I could stuck in some sort of... They have over pairs and two pairs or something. It's just gets way too murky here. I should have just checked. Uh, my hand plays as a bluff catcher and I really, I'm queen. I really, really hate this lead uh, on the turn and on the flop as well. So I think I played super range unaware here. Yes, it's definitely looking at the hands that they had. It's very unlucky that the, the nine didn't came. didn't the but, river? Um, Thought he was going for the check jam. Please. Please. So check jam sounds like something that could land you on the disabled list. <laughs> I didn't want to get bluffed right now. Not in this spot. I like that uh, William Reynolds checked the turn. I definitely might have turned my hand into a bluff because I don't think that he's going to call the turn with uh, two pairs a lot, which makes my bluff even worse. All right, time to jump into the next hand. And it's 2,500. The straddle is still on, so William Reynolds makes it 2,500 to go. Uh, Tony G, 10-6 offsuit. Last time we saw min raises with ace-5 five to 5,000. Uh, maybe this was the big game and a few bottles of wine for Tony G. Uh, I called call with sevens. Getting a bit really. Don't necessarily love this call because I don't close the action. Uh, it's going to be very hard if you look at William Reynolds here uh, to give Tony G a, a lot of uh, respect here with his hand um, and also mine, right? It's, it's going to be very hard for me to have a hand like aces, kings, queens, or ace, king, which means my range is relatively capped. And I really don't think Tony G is going to make a, a play this funky with a strong hand like that as well. I think that Tony's going to have a lot of hands uh, where he sets up some sort of like uh, flop bluff or some sort of spiel, uh, a speech play that he wants to do down the line. 
Um, so I think that it's very dangerous to uh, to call with the sevens here. And I think that if William Reynolds has something like a suited days with a bad kicker, they have an excellent opportunity to just make a 30,000 and get us both to fold. Um, anyway, a lot of these situations went to the flop. Uh, I decided to call with sevens. Reynolds. Grab what I have. And William Reynolds has the perfect hand to call along. Yeah. They don't really block any strong hands. They have reasonable playability. It's only two and a half thousand to call, which is like eight to one. Seven to one. Seven, ace, nine. Lex flops a set. And about as good as a board that I can get. Um, everybody checks through immediately. Uh, there's no real reason for me to lead here. Um, <laughs> I mean, there wasn't any real reason for me to lead in all the other pots as well. But anyway, here I don't, uh, which is nice. If I lead here, uh, my range becomes very hard to play. It's also very weird because I'm probably not going to have aces or ace-king. Um, so I miss the nuts on the board. And um, it's definitely in the preflop raises advantage. And we sort of have two preflop raises, right? We have one guy that made it 2,500, the other made it 5k. Um, so this board's going to get bet a lot. Uh, there's also a draw. So uh, perfect uh, to do some check raising to represent the hand like jacked and suited or king, queen of spades, something like that. Um, but we all check. Uh, Tony doesn't really have any reason to bet. He's going to go into towards pot control with his hand. He's going to see if he can pick bluffs off on future streets. And William Reynolds was just checking to the last preflop aggressor, which was Tony G with the min raise. So lightning checks around. Makes sense from everybody. And this is one of those situations where I just look at it and I just think like, you know, what could have been sort of. Um, and I know that it's, it's very toxic in poker, right? And this is not something that I hold with me for a long time, but... This is also why playing so high above your bankroll is such a stupid mistake. Because if you play these games every week, then this is just another board. It's just another 10 of clubs. It's just another thing that didn't work out. But, you know, at the time, my bankroll was around or a little bit less than a million. So to bring three, four hundred thousand dollars to Vegas with you to play 200, 400 isn't the greatest idea. This is definitely a little, like my MO from back in the day. And it's one of the things uh, that I didn't really care about either. Like I never really had to borrow money. I never got into trouble. Um, so I uh, just did my thing and I played. And if I had to play lower stakes because I had less money, then I would do that as well. So my bankroll management definitely uh, was very questionable back then. Um, but at the same time, uh, I didn't really care either. It does mean that hands like this is, are going to make you a little bit salty afterwards because you start thinking about that one pot. Like what if that one pot could have been different or what if that one score... And I think that's definitely always a sign that you're playing too high. So if you're at home and you lose a cash game buy-in and you want to put your fist through the TV, then maybe you should consider playing a little bit lower stakes because one of the main reasons you get angry is because it matters too much. And you can make it matter less by putting a less uh, big part of your bankroll on the actual table. So it brings multiple draws. We have sevens, um, pot of 16,000, 17,000. At this point, they didn't show any interest. I have a lot of these draws from the big blinds, which- Wrapping a main hand. From the blinds, I should say. Um, I could even have bet bigger, but 13,000 is absolutely fine. What he doesn't know is that Will isn't drawing anymore. He's got a straight. You know no one has eight jack. Except the guy to your right. So actually, technically, he does know someone has eight jack. Very unlikely that William Reynolds has uh, All right. a straight there. Super happy he calls. Uh, Tony G calls, and at this point, all you're thinking about is no spade, no club. No eight, no jack. Style. I'm definitely, I'm promising I'm calling, but I'm thinking about a race, okay? I am contemplating a significant improvement of this pot size. All right, so Tony G uh, has no reason to race. He's going to run into hands that are uh, stronger than him. He could still have the best hand, but he's going to get all the like 10x or let's say William Reynolds has kings. He's going to get all of those hands out by raising. Four hearts on the river. He also might uh, push a hand like six, four of clubs out. Rivers 4, absolutely perfect. You can't really uh, ask for more than this. Even though this card didn't hurt him, Lex's set has officially been cracked. Let's see if he still thinks he can bet it for value. At this point, I could even bet and call all in. That's how strong my hand is. Like this, You're just on cloud 9. The only thing you're considering here is how can I make the most money? I bet 31,000. I think that's quite reasonable. I'm really looking for uh, hands that can call me. A hand like ace-jack, um, you know, a hand like ace-queen that checked through the flop. Uh, William Reynolds has a lot of those. Uh, obviously, two pairs are going to call me. Maybe hand like ace-8 that to block, to block some straights. Um, there's a lot of hands that can call me, um, but there's a lot of one-pair hands as well because the flop was checked through. And that's always something important to remember. Um, otherwise, it could have gone a little bit bigger, but I decided to go for about two-thirds. He just calls. William Reynolds makes a quick call. At this point, I'm still thinking, like, easiest win of my entire life. At least I'm not rising. I mean, 120k pots. 90% I'm calling. 
You know, I'm only, if I'm going to lay this down, I might as well not play poker. Wow. You've got to think if you guys, like, unless Lex made a really big hand. He must be trying to induce an overcall from Tony. William's plan might just be coming together. At this point, I'm thinking, oh, wow, he might call as well. I'm going to win 160k pot. End of the season. Amazing. Wasn't uh, working. Yeah, I fold. Set. I have the nuts. I thought Tony G would do it. Tony G lays it down. <laughs> he liked that 90%. I would have done it. Did you say I had a flash draw? Mm -hmm. And there's a reason why I look so incredibly frustrated here. And it's not just because of the pot. Uh, there was some backstory with me and William Reynolds. And I actually cut out the whole sequence at the end. Uh, William Reynolds gave me like a whole speech. Like he looked at Tony G, gave Tony G a whole speech. After that whole thing, he only announced then that he had the nuts. So I had to wait. A long time before I got announced the nuts, all the time I'm thinking I'm winning the hand throughout the whole hand and I actually exploded on him saying like, hey, this is not the William fucking Reynolds show, like this, is all, this isn't all about you, at least stick to some proper etiquette. Um, and I was really wondering how that was going to come out on TV because I got, you know, really angry and they actually cut it out. And I think that's actually for the best because it didn't really have anything to do with the game. It, I think it was also a little bit based on a misunderstanding, uh, William Reynolds, uh, and I did have a little bit of backstory. I remember one time he uh, online, he timed out because his internet failed, but he had the nuts and he lost a pot against me, a big pot on the river. And he told me if I could show you the hand history, will you send me the money because I had the nuts and I was obviously calling you all in. But he uh, was al always slow rolling a lot of players uh, online. So I told him, go fuck yourself. This is karma for all the slow rolling you're doing. So, you know, we always had a little bit of a competitive uh, atmosphere between us. Um, this hand was insanely frustrating. I actually think that this might be the most frustrating hand for me on the big game. It definitely symbolizes just how poorly things were going um, for me during those weeks. Um, and that's fine as well, you know. But I think that the earlier lesson about playing too high in your bankroll is a very important one. Also looking back on this hand. Um, but, you know, this hand's always going to sting, let's be honest. All right, let's go to the next hand. This hand's also a zinger. Well, action begins on the loose cannon. Bobby Ferdinand, suited one gapper, raises to 2,000. Elky folds, Abe, King Jack, he's in. Okay, so this is the last day of recording. So, remind you, one of these weeks was uh, recorded in one day. So, we play 120 hands or something, 140 hands, and that would make for five episodes. The best loose cannon of the season would get a really nice tournament package. Package They would be flown around the world. They could play all these really nice high rollers on top of also bringing their own cash home. Everything above 100,000 they were able to take home. Now, Bobby the Bus, a.k.a. Mr. Ferdinand, um, he actually uh, understood really well what he had to do to play as a loose cannon. Um, a few hands before this, he was just randomly shoving $70,000 uh, versus a bet on a flop of 996 with a flush draw. Um, so he definitely was playing really big pots trying to get uh, plus money. I think that's really important for this hand. Also, as a guest in this hand, we have Mr. David Fishman, who was an insanely nice person. Uh, and he was a leading uh, loose cannon and he had about 130000 in profit. And he was about to win a package. He had a suit on, his family was there, his kids was there. And then... Um, this hand comes. So Bobby the Bus is about 30, 30,000 down at this point. Can you feel the load? Uh, so he opens with 10 8 suited, which is absolutely fine. It's a great hand to open regardless. Um, I do really want to give him props for the fact that he understood his assignment. He had to finish with the profit. And I call with Queen on off. Now, this is one of those spots, especially with the call before you by Abe Mosseri. Um, this is one of those spots where you just think, okay, you know, I understand a loose cannon has to win money. I understand you have to uh, play pass with them, uh, but I still don't think that queen on offsuit is going to cut it. Um, three betting is not going to work because you're just going to jam anything half decent that looks sexy. Um, so queen nine is just a fold here. Um, I just think that I had an utter amount of disrespect for uh, the players in front of me because Abe Masseri is a mixed game player. Didn't play a whole lot of high stakes, uh, no limit hold them. Um, so I figured that I could win a lot of pots by sheer aggression. Um, but that's obviously a little bit short-sighted because my read on the loose cannon was they were forcing the action. All right, so I think that backstory is really important in this hand. All right, so Bobby the Bus flops the schnitzels here. It goes check, check, check to Veldhaus. He checks. I have a really good hand. I also don't think that Masseri is going to check this board a lot once I can get Jetten out who's in the small blind, and I have definitely the best range on this board. Bobby probably should have bet to build a pot, but it looks like Lex is still giving him a shot to get some money in now. I'm all in. Oh, my God. Oh, I hate seeing this hand so much. All right, so he goes all in. Oh, there's David Fishman, nicest wow. guy on the planet. David Fishman has the lead for the passport and the best seat in the house. He was leading for the passport, and this is obviously when the pondering starts. Um, so one of the things that we should consider here 
is uh, what are some hands that Bobby the Bus could check raise all in with, right? Um, I actually think that he wants to protect Bet a lot with his overpairs on the flop. I think that instinctively somebody doesn't want to check and give a free card on this board. So I think that anything if he has like tens, tens through to aces that he's going to make a bet himself. He's about to come over and take your cards and throw them right in the muck. What Bobby has going for him, it's late in the game and this board is so wet that he really could be shoving with a pretty wide range. Wait, should I really bet this if I'm going to fold this? There's two diamonds on board. Obviously any 8x is a straight draw. Uh, there's 9, 8, 7, 8, 6, 8 suited. I thought that he would be insanely draw heavy because this is a board that he'd normally want some action on. Uh, he, he would never play 8-5, uh, possibly 8-5 suited, but it's so few combos it doesn't really outweigh the fact that he can have a, have a better draw than that. Or sorry, that he can have a good draw. If Lex makes this call, Bobby the Bus will almost certainly double up. I really think that if you play against a loose cannon and he's to force the action, this is almost a snap call. There was some things in the hand that kind of tipped me off that he might be strong, but he also had sort of like a macho demeanor, so that's a little bit harder to read into. Um, a lot of times people can, you know, like act strong because that's just the table presence that they like to have. Um, so that's something that I was trying to figure out. Um, I was going over the other hand, seeing if I could pick up some. The other hands also had flush draws in them. It ended up Lex calls him having a flush draw in those moments. And honestly, I think actually that this hand is such a such a snap call that I thought about for a long time. As it all, I'm absolutely dead. Nuts. Nuts, nuts redraw. All season long, I see loose cannons going all in with ace hide, middle pair, bottom pair. No, no. That's like going through my you can't, head. You can't even hit the nine of diamonds to help you make a full house here. Yeah, nice. And do you want to run it twice or? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And this is so true. Every every time throughout the season, I saw loose cannons do what they had to do at a certain yeah. point in the hand. And Bobby the bus understood his assignment. So he was going all in with these very weak hands. And like I said, I don't think instinctively uh, this is a board where you're going to check over pairs. So I'm going to be up against draws and some nuts, sure. But um, I think that even a hand like sixes just wants to bet the flop and would. Uh, so he needs some very specific hands that I'm going to be dead against. I think they were really talking about like straights and pocket nines. Um, <laughs> That's sick. <laughs> That's sick. <laughs> yeah, David's still laughing. So it was fun what happened after this hand. I'm not going to show you all the hands. You can obviously look at the episodes on the Pokestars channel. Um, after this hand, Bobby the Bus proceeds to slow roll Peter Jett in Aces versus Kings, wins another pot, and they edited it out and did him a lot of favors. But I still want to give you guys some backstory because... At a certain point, uh, at a certain point, he wins a hand and he comes ahead of David Fishman. Like I said, David Fishman was a math teacher. He's there with his whole family, has his Sunday's best on, and he sits around the couch thinking he might win a tournament package. And Bobby the Bus, like very abrasive, like you know, fist pumping, whatever, like talking some shit. And he just looks over. He just looks over at David when he gets ahead of him, and he just gives him the the stare down and the fist pump. And everybody, everybody, you know, on set was like, "Oh my god, I can't root for this fucking guy." But, you know, the edit definitely did him a favor, which obviously, you know, makes a lot of sense. Um, you can't, you know, villainize the person that wins, like, a really nice package. I have to, my hat's off to him. He did play a lot of his hands correct. He ran, like, he ran, like, uh, Jesus on Nikes there at the end, uh, to be really honest as well with all the hands. But definitely uh, the conclusion to a really, really frustrating big game season for me. Um, I think spots, uh, spots where I played really well, I ran into bad ranges. I misplayed some, I misplayed some hands that also didn't work out. Uh, ran into some really good hands as you could see um, this episode as well uh, not for nothing had nothing really going my way but that's all good you know never really lost any sleep over poker and i think that one of the good things that i always had with these shows is that i brought uh, money with me that was a way too big percentage of my bankroll but i already always accepted the risk of playing with that money and i did that online as well um, and i think that's always important that you uh, accept what you're about to do um, and I think it's even more important to not take risks like that. Um, back in the day, it was a lot easier. Poker was a lot softer. There were a lot more opportunities. Uh, everybody's grown up, everybody's matured, and um, you really have to stick to a bankroll uh, schedule. Um, if you also want to talk some poker, then uh, join my Discord. The links are in the description. I really hope you enjoyed this episode. Uh, please like and subscribe. Um, as you can see, we're continuously putting out content, and this is never going to stop. So I hope to see you guys next time, and uh, take care. Bye. Thank you, thank you. No more of these freaking hands. They're just... Ugh.